Hello guys! Welcome back to Not Just Mecha! It's Marco here and today we do a ton of experiments! Painting events are finally a thing again, and I really feel the need to step back into the game with its full range of possibilities that I barely started to explore and tackle before the pandemic. I'm a fantasy and sci-fi figure painter, and historical models outside tanks and armors are still kind of new to me, so I chose to start my training on a model where I can practice being more grounded and clean, but without the menace of uniformology looming behind my back. <laughs> I know, in a way, this can still be considered borderline fantasy, and for sure not tight as a Napoleonic grenadier in parade uniform. But the simple essentiality of the sculpt, its focus on the human body, and the simple shapes of the equipment really put you immediately into a different field, and it still needs a bit of historical research. This guy is a Murmillo, the tank of Roman Imperial Age gladiators equipped with a gladium and scutum, a big heavy rectangular shield, and with all the visible body around the shield, aka legs, right arm and head covered in armor, this was a role for the tallest and the beefiest fighters. So I really pushed on the definition of the muscles, and I set the scene at the end of an hot afternoon. That's when the best gladiators used to enter the arena, as climatic peak of the day of entertainment. Because yeah, my guy has to be special. Don't forget to drop a like to help the diffusion of this video and the channel, and of course subscribe to join my painting journey in every corner of the hobby. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page, where you can find articles, extra material, and the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! So, here is the first dilemma. How far I can push light and environmental information before going too far? I want to model a sharp, strong musculature, and I need a sharp and strong contrast to do that, but I want also to keep a general, realistic feel, without going too much into excessively crazy cinematic territories. So how can I balance these two apparently contrasting inspirations? I still don't have a definitive answer, and you'll see during the process how I change my mind about the whole thing. But every time I'm in some kind of doubt in the sketching stage, I simply start playing with a mid-value grey to just get a first general, non-compromising idea of the shapes I'm tackling. Sure, the sketch is super useful and kind of the foundation of my process, but it's still only a sketch and it shouldn't be legally binding. The model is made essentially by two elements, flesh and metal, and because of their scale, extension and open flatness, I want to push on a clear, in your face, extreme contrast of finishes between the two. So I decide to break the smoothness of the skin to a tactile, granular level, and build all my tones on top of a realistic micro roughness. I start the process with an extremely light and gentle dry brushing over the simple modulation of the sketch, but I have soon realized that it's really too soft to be perceived as rough on these uh, large volumes, so I change gear, prioritizing the texture over maintaining the sketch. <laughs> dry brushing really brings uh, the nipples out. I know, it's not pretty at this stage, and it doesn't match the initial sketch anymore, but I can easily bring back the shades in the next stages, with the video and photo references I have of the light setting, and I gained a ton of more precious, quick, thick, textural movement. But this is just the beginning. This is uh, just one of the layers of information that I want to add to the skin. I consider this initial rough texture 
as the uncountable mass of uh, micro wrinkles, discolorations, capillaries, little scars, keloids that cover human skin. And now I soften and bring together this effect, painting the pores with a finer and more controlled layer of microvolumes. Again, now this is all about the texture, the physical and visual consistency of the material, and I completely ignore our shapes and volumes in this process. It's difficult to appreciate the effect on this white on white application, but check on the black base of the bust the kind of spray I'm using. In the airbrush I have the usual white ink that I use for my smooth black and white value and zenithal sketches, but simply turning down the air pressure I get a totally different result. I lowered it from the secondary gauge on the body of my airbrush, so I didn't touch the compressor and I can tell you precisely what pressure I'm using, but simply turn it down until you start seeing this kind of dotting. <laughs> this will go down in history as the ugliest early stage look of my repertoire. To set a clear contrast of finish from the very beginning on the second main element, I create my metallic effect over the untouched, super smooth finish of my initial explorative spray, using the most shiny, glossy and fluid paints in my collection. I want to render a goldy bronze exposed to a warm summer setting sun, so I can safely add pure orange yellow to the fluid silver. The chromatic neutrality of silver, that's essentially a shiny grey, tones the yellow down into more realistic territories, and the combination of the shine of the metallic pigments and the natural glossiness of the ink creates a polished reflective finish, able to catch and bounce a ton of light. Their fluid consistency also makes them spread, deposit and dry in a super solid smooth layer that makes everything even more polished and reflective. The base for the crest is simple contrast blood angels red, because I don't need anything more complicated than that. And I like to use this old game ink from Vallejo to prime little leather elements. It's just another ink, but it tends to bring a more satin finish, and it dries super quickly, thing that creates a ton of artifacts, smudges and imperfections that are perfect for a quick foundational sense of leather. But obviously, for the same reasons, it's terrible for skins. <laughs> Don't use it as a wash for skins, as the label uh, might uh, trick you into doing. Technically, my first idea was to paint the skin and this uh, precise step with filters of oil paint, but uh, the experimental nature of this uh, training project and the need for immediate answers made me move to inks. Still, the interesting bit is that you can totally obtain the same result using transparent oils with a brush. It takes a bit more time in terms of application and drying time, but you get way more playability, more options and the ability to dynamically change things. And for a final competition version, I would for sure go with oils. Raw Sienna is always a perfect base for tanned Caucasian skin, especially if you are looking for a Mediterranean feel, and like in my case, an even better option if you can use the extra content of yellow to sell the extra environmental warmth from the setting. Warmth is my keyword here, so a warm orangey brown is a natural second step for uh, this kind of progression. 
My light source is a low setting sun, hitting the gladiator from the front right. So even without the recorded information of the work of the sketch and the first uh, light dry brush, the angle of the shadows is uh, pretty easy to figure out and uh, to bring back uh, with the same vectors. Burnt Amber, in this case, is just a safe net. Or better, a Linus blanket. It's uh, super soft and transparent, and uh, chromatically it's ambiguous enough uh, to easily breed a huge variety of extremely different tones. So I like to have its uh, discrete contribute in place before committing to tones that have a darker or a more powerful chromatic impact. Like this muted pink, for example. This is me going against the natural impulse of grabbing pure, saturated, fluorescent magenta to do this layer. I want the warmth of the scene to develop mostly into the darker mid-tones, leaving the lights into more realistic, slightly desaturated territories, so I can safely push a bit on the saturation and warm temperature of these parts, considering also the ideal contribute of uh, blood vessels, pumping a ton of blood under the skin of a guy ready to fight under the sun. I close the shadows using a transparent muted green. Again, I'm holding myself back from going completely into turquoise or blue territories. Blue is a realistic and natural counterpart of a yellow orange light. It's its a technical complementary tone, a source of a vibrant contrast, and a key component of the palette for human skin. But to keep things more grounded and less quote unquote improved by a director of photography, I disguise its presence into a desaturated green. Yellow is already a big component of my composition, and it easily accepts the green with a more subtle and controllable movement into the cold part of the color wheel and of my shadows. At the end, this is just a color sketch to replace the black and white version that I have sacrificed to the god of textures. At the moment, this seems a bit of a mess, with all this glossiness and shine bouncing light everywhere. The need of some experience and the clear mental visualization of the next stage is one of the small downsides of uh, working with inks, but after a bit of practice you start uh, knowing that after a light coat of matte varnish you have created something like this. Better. I've also used uh, the exact uh, same inks in the exact uh, same order to add uh, the exact uh, same environmental sensations on the armor but keeping its glossiness to get even more bouncing light. Rewatching my footage, I can tell that the effect is really subtle when seen from the eye of the camera, but I can assure you that the skin is still extremely gritty and full of physical textures, because the extreme transparency and thin application of the ink didn't cover anything of all that work and its real physical thickness and roughness. And from this point on, the brush has the full responsibility to preserve and enhance all these ideas and visual information to crazy new heights. You know that when painting I advocate for a perfected cinematic view of reality, and even if this work definitely still falls into this view, this is also an exercise in subtlety and in a bearable amount of realism. So I keep my palette super simple, contained and mostly limited to natural earth tones and turquoise. Because f*** all these rules, I want to use turquoise. <laughs> 
But where I'm really going to exercise extreme control and restrain is in the brushstrokes and the finish they create. On fantasy and uh, sci-fi skins, I tend to add a ton of different effects in a inhomogeneous mix of realistic and extremely stylized brushstrokes that can go from uh, super soft glazes and filters to visible uh, comic book style cross etching. But here I use only and exclusively a dense pattern of glazing by dotting. I load the brush with paint diluted to its extreme transparency, I unload the excess of water on paper towel, and I densely stipple the surface with hundreds and hundreds of little dots. This creates uh, soft transitions, with the gentle progression of uh, large glazes created with the classic fluid mop motion. But instead of getting a perfectly smooth, silky surface, I get a whole new level of depth with a realistic, uh, subtle fine grit. This repeated over and over and over again for a number of hours. The palette for my bronze is a bit more complex, to accommodate for the non-accommodating nature of metallic paints. I have a basic set of metallic pigments that goes from a dark old bronze to a warmer and colder version of gold to pure silver, and a selection of highly saturated inks for the chromatic reflections and all their transitions. Here I'm taking in account stuff like uh, the general uh, warm mood, the color of the direct light, the reflections from uh, the sand of the arena, the gladiator's body, the blue sky, and everything in between these uh, main elements. So the set is large because it needs uh, to cover a lot of visual ground. And uh, here is the big theme of the two clashing finishes again. Instead of using hundreds of transparent dots, I use hundreds of opaque, super thin lines. My inspiration for uh, this kind of finish comes from uh, the humble spoon. Well, there is a bit more to that. I found a lot of references for uh, bronze armors, new, old and ancient, even of this uh, precise class of gladiator and these uh, precise elements, and uh, that material has been precious to understand the volumes, the bounces of light and uh, their levels of uh, reflectivity. But because of the scale, in none of the pictures I was really able to understand the finer finish of the polished, well-kept metal. So yeah. At the end, a spoon gave me all the answers I needed. The process is long, but quite simple, because the macro shapes of the colored pools of light and shades are in place from the chromatic sketch, so I just need to loosely match the tone and temperature of those areas with my tiny little scratches. Using metallic pigments and inks, I don't lose anything of the shiny finish, and I just break the toy-like smoothness with all these little battle damages, witness marks, and visually interesting imperfections. The work on the two main blocks is not uh, chronologically linear, and I switch between uh, the two palettes a few times to adapt uh, the progress, the adjustments, and uh, the increasing definition of uh, one side to the other one. And with the change of the palette, I keep uh, changing my brushstrokes.
Dotting, dotting. Scratching, scratching. Dotting, dotting. Scratching, scratching. And here is the final result. I'm quite satisfied with the visual output, and this is for sure one of my best renderings of human skin, but I'm not sure I've used the right aesthetic frame for a proper historical model. My original plan was to use oil paints, but I switched to acrylics for the extra grittiness, but I ended up with a very oil-like finish and a general feel, because recently I've studied a ton of Renaissance paintings and I got trapped into that aesthetic that is often more cinematic than a movie. But I don't think uh, historical necessarily means uh, photorealistic, and I like this uh, painterly take for a character set in an almost uh, mythical past, for which paintings are kind of our uh, visual reference, and this super realistic metal is a nice counterpart to balance the equation. The restraint in the use of tones and techniques really paid off, so I'm super curious to try again on a more modern subject. Something set maybe in the Second World War, where I cannot use any fantasy trope. And now that we are at the very end, I can reveal my dirty secret. I couldn't resist, and I added a fantasy blue reflection under the pectorals. I had to, it was the perfect spot. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys.